In his book, When Men Think Private Thoughts, author and pastor Gordon McDonald quotes a former college football player. I was an interior lineman, he said. I played every game for four years, and there were three other guys who played almost every game with me. And I can't tell you how much we loved each other. We won, we lost. We helped each other through injuries, through good and bad romances, through our studies. There wasn't anything we didn't do together. I could cry with those guys. And there wasn't anything we couldn't say to each other. And I'm 38, and I'm still grieving. When football was over and we said goodbye, it was like a death. Maybe you know what he's talking about. Maybe there was a time in your life when you were surrounded by friends, and you had great relationships, and now you're feeling alone. Loneliness is a growing problem in our society. And one article begins, youth is a period most associated with great promise and an overall sense of freedom. But youth can also be a time when many of us feel very lonely. A new major study of 55,000 people found that the loneliest group of people were those between the ages of 16 and 24. 40% of them said they were lonely very often. Of those 75 and over, 27% said that they were lonely. You kind of more expect that, but the younger ones is the surprise. They pointed out social media has been found to have an impact on the sense of loneliness. While it's certainly not the cause of it, for many, their time in social media makes them feel even more disconnected because they have all these friends, and yet they're not really connected to them. And their friends' apparently perfect lives don't match up with their own. Well, loneliness has been a problem for a long time. To point out how lonely people can be, Chuck Swindoll mentioned an ad in a Canvas newspaper that said, I will listen to you talk for 30 minutes without comment for $5. Now, this was a number of years ago, probably the equivalent of about $15 an hour this person would make. Now, who is going to respond to that? I mean, that's got to be a hoax. The reality was they soon had 10 to 20 people per day calling in. And again, what I loved is, what they said is, I'll listen without comment. So all they have to do is just go, mm-hmm, yep. Like, you just imagine, they clean their house, mm-hmm, yep, sure, uh-huh. But that's how lonely people were, that, that they wanted to talk to somebody, even a stranger, they had to pay the pain of loneliness is so sharp that some are willing to do anything for that time of companionship. As his UCLA football team suffered through a poor season back in the 70s, head coach Pepper Rogers came under intense pressure and criticism from the fans and the alumni. Things got so bad, he now remembers with a smile, that friends became hard to find. He said, my dog was my only true friend. He told his wife, though, that every man needed two good friends. So he said, my wife bought me another dog. <laughs> Here's the thing. Jesus understands these feelings of loneliness. You know, in his ministry here on earth, Jesus was often abandoned. His own family deserted him. They seemed to doubt him. His best friends, his companions for three years, his disciples in his moment of need couldn't stay awake to pray with him and then abandoned him when he was arrested. His foes did all they could to destroy and discredit him. And so how wonderfully comforting it is for us to know when we feel lonely, that Jesus understands that. That when we feel like we need someone there for us, he knows. And so we need to remember this as we begin. We're going to talk about friendship, but I want to begin by reminding you of this. Jesus is the best friend we're ever going to have. Proverbs 18 tells us, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. If you have friends who are not reliable, you're going to be in trouble in life. Why? Because when the bottom falls, and it will, they won't be there for you. And so, it's so important to have that friend who sticks closer than a brother. And some of you have friends like that. But I want to tell you that there's a friend who always will stick closer than a brother, and that's Jesus. He will never forsake us. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 13 tells us this. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now that passage is actually quoting from Joshua chapter 1, where God told Joshua those words, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In Hebrews, now in the New Testament, it's being applied to all of us. That God has promised his children he will not leave us. We can count on him. Now the word leave in Hebrews 13 here translates a Greek word, which means, means to send back, or to loosen, or to sink. He's saying, I'll never do that to you. 
Two ne negatives in the Greek text preceded. In the English, if you have two negative statements, it actually makes it positive. That's when Pink Floyd saying, we don't need no education. What my English teacher back in like eighth grade pointed out is they are actually saying, we need education. But in English, that's two negatives make a positive. That is not the case in Greek. In Greek, it basically it kind of says it again. It keeps making it more important. So literally, it's I will not, I will not cease to, up, to, to be there with you, to uphold you. He said, I'll never leave you, I'll never will I forsake you. The word forsake is a compound of three Greek words, when put together means to abandon, to leave, to desert. And so he says, I'll never do that to you. And now it's three negatives. So he's saying, I will not, I will not, I will not leave you helpless or hopeless or alone. I won't abandon you. Our friends and family, they will let us down. But we can always turn to our loving God and know that he will be there for us. So he's the one we turn to first. He's the one we should look to the most. And yet God also made us for relationships. It was his idea that we would need other people. The idea of the church was his idea. We talked about this some last week. That we're not to be alone watching this just on some video, watching your favorite TV preacher. That's not enough. We need one another. We need relationships. But according to Paul, 70% of people say that there's a serious void in their lives when it comes to deep friendships. Yeah, you know, we live in such a rat race here in New Jersey. It makes it difficult to find time to invest in creating friends. Carol is a novelist. She says, friendship is an occupation. I could be a good friend, or I could be a writer. I can't do both. She's chosen to be a writer. Maybe you're like her. You're not willing to make the changes and to give the time it's going to take to create real friendships. Julie Hoover, a former vice president of ABC, said, I'm so booked, my definition of a friend is someone who doesn't call me. Maybe some of you understand that. Those of you who are younger are like, of course, no friend would call me. <laughs> you text someone, you don't call your friend. That's, who would do that? Well, those of us who are older would do that. But the idea is that leave me alone is what she's saying. Well, how many friends do you have? More important, how many friends are you investing in? You know, some of you are saying, I'm an introvert. You know, it's just, it's not easy for me to create friendships. Some of you might be thinking, you know, I've got family here, or I have my work, and I really don't need friends. Maybe you've been hurt by your friends in the past, and you're really saying, I, I don't want to open myself to, up to that again. But we need friends to be there for us always, but especially when we fall. And listen, all of us will fall. All of us will have struggles in life. You might lose your job. You might be the victim of a crime. You might have a health scare happen. You may have family problems. There's so many things that can go wrong. And if there's no one there for you, you're in trouble. If you're alone emotionally and relationally, you're going to be in serious trouble. God didn't intend us to face struggles in life alone. He didn't design us for isolation. You know, last night I just happened to come across, there was a news feed. Um, I was looking on my phone and uh, a news feed came up that said this. When you think of the things that can boost your chance of a long, healthy life, you probably default straight to diet and exercise. But it turns out having good friends is also key. They cited a study where researchers looked at 300,000 people over an eight-year period. They state this. Those with strong social relationships were 50% more likely to survive during the study period than those with poor quality relationships. They said this health effect could be compared to quitting smoking and actually has a bigger impact on life than interventions like reducing obesity. The finding remains constant across age, sex, health status, cause of death, meaning no matter what, people who have deep friendships were much more likely to live longer. They say it helps slow down the body clock. Friends are that important. Some of you are so in, I'm going to live as long as I can, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to take care of my body, I'm going to do all these things. Well, if you don't have friends, then you're missing a crucial component. God made us for relationships. So if friendship is so important, how do we go about doing it? You know, it's not easy for many. How do we build and maintain friendships with one another? You know, in college for me it was easy. I lived on campus at a Christian college. There were so many great guys around. It takes a lot more work here where we live to do it. So how? 
Well, let me say there's no mathematical formula. Some of you love a step-by-step -step process. Do these five steps, and I guarantee that you will have tons of friends. I can't guarantee that. But I do want to share five things from the book of Proverbs, that if you do these things, you'll begin to create some relationships that can be the kind that God wants. And so we see this, first of all. A great friend is committed for life. A friend loves at all times, we're told, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who have been victims of fair weather friends. People they became close with. Really, a relationship began to grow, and then maybe something happened. Maybe there was a disagreement, an argument, a time of trouble, and then the other person just poof, they were gone. Well, the proverb says a friend loves at all times. And that's the kind of friends we're to be to others. You know, they get married, you're still their friend. They are in an accident and lose the use of their legs and can't do the things you enjoy. You're still their friend. We need to be there for one another. In Hope Again, Chuck Swindoll writes, Are you cultivating such friendships? Are you being a friend? Are there a few folks who will stand near you, sheltering you with their branches? He says, Jay Kessler, my long-term friend and formerly the president of Taylor University, president when I was there at Taylor, has said that the one of his great hopes in life is to wind up with at least eight people who will be at his funeral, and if it lasts for three hours, they won't look at their watch. <laughs> so now I'll ask, do you have eight friends like that? Three hours? I'll look at my watch. <laughs> that, that'd be tough. That's, that's a good friend. Well, being a friend to a person in need often involves inconvenience. You might have to change your schedule. You might have to miss the finale of your favorite TV show. You might have to put your cell phone down and really listen and, like, not respond to it. Scary stuff, big stuff. The list goes on. But a great friend is committed for life, not just when things are easy and not just when things are fun, but they're there for one another. Well, the next thing we see from Proverbs, a great friend is honest. See, a faithful friend is not afraid to tell you the truth when you need to hear it. It says this, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. So better is open rebuke than hidden love. So in other words, you're looking for someone who will tell you the truth. It says wounds from a friend can be trusted. I like what Oscar Wilde has said, A true friend always stabs you in the front. <laughs> Wounds from a friend can be trusted. The idea is that they'll say things that are truthful. They may hurt, but you can trust them. It says an enemy multiplies kisses. You've probably had friend, people like that that you've known who are like, oh, I love that shirt. That's so you should wear that. Oh, I love it. I tell everyone else, can you believe that shirt? That thing is awful. They kiss you to your face. They're so wonderful and warm to your face. We need to be people who are honest with each other. They can be truthful to one another. That's what real friends do. At Men's Group this week, we looked at a screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis. We looked at a four-page section of it. And in it, he talks about how deluded we can be. And how everyone else can see our flaws, and yet we have no idea they are there. And that's why we need one another. We need people who will hold up a mirror and show us who we really are, not just who we wish we were, who we pretend we would be. So do you have real friends in your life who will tell you the truth? Are you the kind of friend who will speak the truth to your friends? Now I want to say, listen, speaking truth to friends is a risky thing. Often we don't want to hear the truth. Often we don't like it. I would encourage you to pray and seek God. Lord, is now the time. But we need to be willing to speak truth to our friends. Ephesians 4.15 says we're to speak the truth in love. And that's the key to this. Some people, they love to speak the truth. And by love, they speak the truth. Like, they love to speak mean, hard things. I can't wait to share this truth. But if you're not doing it in love, then stop. Because if you speak in love, you come humbly. You don't come like, I'm good and you're not. I know things you don't. You come humbly with this. I know I've got a million things wrong with me. I know as soon as I share this with you, you're going to have 20 things about me pop up in your mind. Oh, yeah, well, how about this? But, but I feel like I need to share this with you. And then you do it gently and loving. Friends, we need to be cultivating those kind of relationships. And letting our friends tell them, like, hey, listen, I want to hear the truth from you. 
I want you to feel free to tell me what I'm really like. And then begin to be open, because real friends are honest with one another. A great friend also helps their friend grow spiritually. We looked at this verse last week. Jeff happened to send it out this week in a men's group email. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So the idea is that we make each other better. The imagery here is of a blacksmith. And the blacksmith has is, is got this sword, and they want to make it. They're creating it, and they would use this heavy iron to hit the iron sword, and they would warm up the sword, you know, they'd stick it in the forge and heat it up, and then they would beat it and form it with that heavy iron mallet. And they would work on it to create the sharpened sword that would eventually be made. And that's what we're to be for one another. I should sharpen you. I should make you better. You should sharpen me. You should make me better. That's what God is calling us to do for one another. And we see this type of picture in 1 Samuel chapter 23. It's the story of David and Jonathan. If you know that story, David has slain Goliath. He's now a hero. The people love David, and King Saul begins to become jealous. People like him more than me, and so Saul decides he's going to have David killed. And he goes after him. But Saul's own son, Jonathan, the prince, the man who would be king, but knew he never would be because God had appointed David, and he knew this. He was still friends with him, and he supported David. And so we read this. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David Horish and helped him find strength in God. They had the kind of friendship where he goes to him and, and helps him find his strength in the Lord. He doesn't give him strategies for how to be his father. He points him back to God and lets him know that the Lord will be there for him and will help him. And we need to seek friends like this and we need to be these kind of friends who help each other grow. And are there for one another in the midst of our needs. I read a story of a pastor. He talked about going to the hospital. Visit one of his members who had a heart attack. He said when he got to the man's room. I guess this was later. And I uh, guess the guy's room. He said the room was filled with people. From this guy's small group. Who had come there. This guy had really invested in his small group. He would gotten involved in his church. And had really committed to making friends. And had done the work it takes. Being there for others. <coughs> serving others. And now he's surrounded by friends. The pastor said he couldn't even get in. There were so many people there. Just like Jonathan, these true friends came in this man's time of need, helping him find his strength in God. One of the man's friends came out to the pastor and said this, you can go home if you'd like, because we've got this covered. The pastor says at first he was a little offended. Like, what? But then he thought, how awesome, because this is what it's supposed to be about. About us being there for one another. You know, I want to say as a church, our goal is to love God, love people, and serve others. Loving God, that's what we do Sunday morning. We learn in Sunday school. We spend time in our own devotions and our time of Bible reading. We learn to love God. Serving others, we do that. So right now we're in the nursery doing that. These chairs are set up because there are people who serve. They get torn down because there's people who serve. There's all these ways people serve, but loving people is such a hard thing that so many of us miss. And by that, we're talking about creating these kind of deep friendships and relationships. And we say that we believe this happens best in small groups of people. Sunday morning, you can chat. You can't share deeply the way you can when you get in a small group and study the Bible together and pray for each other and begin to open up more and more. I would challenge you, if you're not in a small group, join one and look into it. It'll be worth your time. And we have different small groups. For some of you, you're like, I tried one, I didn't like it. Listen, they're all different. That is deliberate because some people like one thing and some like another. So check them out. I'd encourage you to go to a Sunday school class. There's the amazing adult Bible study here, taught by godly people. And there's times of discussion within that. My wife runs a group for women. Discussion is very much a part of that. But get involved. Look for ways to grow. So you can begin to spur one another on. You can help each other by sharpening one another. Like David and Jonathan, we need to choose friends and be the kind of friends who help our friends grow spiritually. Well, the next thing we see is this. A great friend is willing to forgive. When we spend time with people, we will inevitably hurt them. Sometimes intentionally, normally unintentionally. And when we spend time with people, they will hurt us also. That is just what happens. A faithful friend is someone who cuts you some slack and forgives you for what you've done. 
without bringing it back up in your face. So Proverbs 17 says, He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. So it says, He who covers over an offense promotes love. In other words, bury the hatchet. You don't just hold on to it. You don't keep reminding the person. It says, whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. You may know people like this. They just can't let things go. Someone hurt them. The person's apologized. They've asked their freedom. They won't let it go. They hold on to it. They repeat it over and over and over again. We need friends who will forgive. Because Colossians 3 reminds us, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's the challenge. Jesus said, taught us how to pray. Forgive us our debts, our sins, as we forgive our debtors, as we forgive those who sinned against us. We're saying, God, please forgive me the way I forgive others. That's a scary prayer, right? Like, Lord, please don't forgive me the way I forgive others. Like, like really forgive me, Lord. And yet we're called to forgive each other. If we are going to have long-lasting relationships, we have to be willing to forgive. Your friend will hurt you. They will let you down. They're human and fallible. So are you, and you'll need their forgiveness. One pastor writes, I was once, I once deeply wronged a very close friend. When I realized what I'd done and how much I hurt him, I called him up and met with him over breakfast. And I'll never forget what happened. He said, we were sitting in Perkins. We'd order our food. I couldn't eat anything because I felt so terrible about what I had done. I put my fork down and said, Mike, I'm so sorry. I was wrong for what I did, and I ask for you to forgive me. I'm sick about it. So he said, tears are literally splashing into my eggs. I blow up, Lord, would you please forgive me? He said, Mike looked at me with sadness in his eyes and said, brother, I already have. I already have. That's what this means, to cover over. And he says this, from that point on, Mike never brought it up again. It was like he took a blanket and covered it all for me, never lifting up a corner of it. He never repeated the matter, and our relationship was restored. Someone has said, if you really want to know who your friends are, just make a mistake, and then you'll know. Because real friends forgive. Real friends understand their flaw just like you are. But at the same time, you need to be a real friend and understand your friends are flawed and they're going to need your forgiveness too. Is God maybe calling you today to forgive someone? Is there something you've held on to? A relationship he wants to fix? True friends forgive each other. And then the fifth thing is this. A great friend doesn't gossip. Proverbs 11 says, A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. The Bible has a lot to say about gossip. You know, we don't tend to think gossip's a big deal, like idolatry, worshiping other gods, that's a bad sin. You know, cheating on your spouse, that's bad. Gossip's like, it's no big deal, you're just talking a little. The Bible's clear, gossip is dangerous and destructive. And so it says a gossip betrays a confidence. You can find something in them and they share it with others. A trustworthy person keeps a secret. In Psychology Today, a survey of more than 40,000 Americans, the quality people said they most valued in a friend was the ability to keep a confidence. Do you have friends you can be completely real with? Do you have friends that, that you can trust the deepest, darkest things in your life and know they'll be safe with them? Proverbs 16 warns, it says, A perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. You know, gossip just works at destroying other people. It separates friendships. George Eliot writes, Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but to pour them all out just as they are, chaff and grain, together knowing that a faithful hand will take and sift through them. Keep what's worth keeping, and then with a breath of kindness, blow the rest away. In other words, I have a friend that you can talk to, and you know, sometimes you're going to say things, you're like, afterwards, like, I can't believe I said that. And your friend just goes, ah, they didn't know what they're talking about. And they let it go. That's the kind of friends we need to look for, but it's also the kind of friends we need to be. You see, two friends are able to share their dark secrets, 
They're able to share the areas they struggle in because they know that their friend will keep it safe. Do you have trouble keeping secrets? Do you tend to share things you shouldn't share? The Bible would call that sin. It's gossip. <clears throat> and so we need to learn to put things in the vault. It's a phrase Bob Stutz, I think it was the first time I ever heard it. Maybe you know Bob, he's a member of our church. But years ago, Bob had called me, just had something to share with me. He wanted me to pray for him in this area. I forget what was going on. It was something, you know, life. And uh, he said, Mark, Mark, I'm going to share something. I want you to put it in the vault. And he explained the vault means it never comes back out again to anyone else. I'll, ne I'll never share it with anyone. I said, sure, Bob. I totally. That's no problem. And there's been several times over the years where he'll call and say, I got to just put it in the vault, Mark. And that means I don't go home and tell Dad, like, oh, you won't believe what Bob is dealing with right now. No. I put it in the vault. He knows it's safe there. We need to be the kind of people that others know they can safely share those things with and that they will be trusted. And we need to look for those kind of friends. Now, maybe you've been listening to this sermon and you've thought, man, I would love a friend like this. And this is the kind of person I would like to see. Well, I wonder this. As you ask yourself, where can I find these kind of people? Are you one of these kind? Because these kind of people want people who will forgive them also. They want people they can trust. Our selfish hearts are always saying, what's in it for me? Man, I want a great friend. I'm not going to be a great friend to them. I'm really selfish. I'm not going to sacrifice. I'm probably going to gossip about them. I'm probably going to hold on to things. But I really want a good friend. That's not how it works. We need to be the kind of people God has called us to be to our friends. Because a great friend is committed for life. They're honest. They help their friend grow spiritually. They're willing to forgive. They don't gossip. I wonder, are you that kind of friend? Tolkien wrote the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Many of you may not know the movies or actually came from books. And he was a Christian. And some of the imagery in it, you really can see his Christian faith coming out. And some of what you see is the beauty of friendship, of true, deep, deep friendship. Matter of fact, the first book is called The Fellowship of the rings. Fellowship was a decidedly Christian name. And this whole idea that this fellowship would stand together. In the scene we're going to see, Frodo, the main character, has been given the terrible task of destroying a ring of incredible power and evil. And he's going to slip away from his friends because he knows that this will likely lead to his death and it's going to be a horrible journey. And so he wants to do it alone and not risk their lives. Let's watch. <laughs> Sam is that friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
And friends, that's the kind of person we are called to be. Again, we want those friends, but it takes work. It's going to take effort. It's going to take energy. You're going to have to cultivate it because it doesn't just happen. It's going to take a real concerted effort. It's going to cost you at times. Again, I challenge you, join a care group. Get in a Sunday school class. Find a way to begin to connect with other believers. Because some of you have great friends, but they don't know Jesus. And when they give you advice, it is terrible advice. Because it is completely contrary to what the Bible would teach. To what God would want you to know. So begin to create deep friendships with your unchurched people around you. But also to find Christian friends who will be there. In closing, I'd like to challenge you to turn your attention to Christ because He is the one who's going to supply the strength I've been talking about. Some of you are introverts. This is going to be so difficult for you. Some of you, your lives are so busy and scheduled, it's going to be difficult. Some of you love your hobbies and your Netflix shows and the things you do so much. You don't really want to give up those things to create friendships. But God wants to help you because, listen, all of us will come to a time in life where we will need people to stand with us and be there for us. God wants you to develop forever friends. People who will love you unconditionally, will be there for you, and will be with you in eternity. And he wants us to be that kind of friend to others. Remember, he wants to give us the power to serve unselfishly, to forgive unconditionally, to love faithfully. God wants to help us create these kind of relationships. But finally, I want to remind you that even when your friends fail you, and they will, if you're married, your spouse will fail you, your kids will fail you. Our son Joel got one call once he started boot camp, and uh, Joel's girlfriend texted us yesterday to say, I got a call from Joel. <laughs> <laughs> even Joel's younger brother, who always sides with Joel in any discussion, said, I can't believe he did that. And Dave was really mad. Not that he wanted to talk to Joel. He didn't. <laughs> he was mad for us. People will let you down. They just do. I guarantee if my sons want to make a list of all the times dad let them down, it would take them days. God will never let you down. So that's our ultimate hope. Create friendships. It's important. But remember, no one is enough. But God is. We can always look to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for showing us what love looks like when you sent your son to die for us. And we thank you that Jesus is that friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord, we thank you that you said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so, Father, help us to run to you and to turn to you when trouble comes. But I also would ask today that you would help us to do the difficult work of creating real and deep friendships with other believers. Lord, help us to get past our hang-ups and our past hurts and our excuses and our busyness. And Lord, help us to invest in things that will matter for eternity, like people. Lord, give us one or two or three or four or five real friends that we can be open and honest with and that will challenge us and who can be open and honest with us. Lord, I pray in this church that you'd help us to be that place where real relationships are built. As we learn to love you, as we learn to love people, and as we serve others. Holy Spirit, help us, we would ask and pray. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand.